Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Denver CMX Connect. Um, today, we have a very exciting event for you. You are going to get to speak to Venya, Samantha Venya Logan about the three things you need to know to facilitate your community. Uh, I have... I have asked a few questions in the general area if you want to answer them. Um, it's a CMX tradition to post your LinkedIn if you want to connect with other attendees, and I hope you will. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about, uh, about Venya. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Socially Constructed Online, where she helps brands build thriving communities, as well as offering expert training to community managers who are trying to do the same. If you have any questions for her, please post them in the Q&A area. I'll be monitoring that throughout the entire event, and we'll make sure toward the end that we have a little bit of time to get your questions answered. Um, okay, and... Um, if there is not time at the end of the session, we will have an opportunity to move over to her Discord server and um, ask more questions there. So without further ado, let's bring Venya up to the stage. Welcome, Venya. Hello, hello. I'm super excited about this, actually. Um, funny enough, we're actually going to be talking a lot about the chat and Q&A session and stuff like that. So. Uh, definitely be on there as much as possible. We're looking for a lot of connection and a lot of interaction because a large majority of community fa facilitator roles, as Lori is doing right now, is basically not just hosting an event, but stoking a lot of conversation in that chat. So that's what we're going to be learning about today, how to do that. Um, yeah. All right. Um, let me go ahead and get my slides shared real quick so that we can get through the boring part and then move into the act interactive parts if possible. All right, so uh, can I just get a quick hands up? Is everyone seeing the slides? I can see okay. them. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome, great. Um, so we're basically going to be discussing three things about being a great community facilitator, but first we have some requisite uh, information. So who I am, um, I believe I've already gone over this before. Uh, we have a few people already in my Discord, but just so you know, um, I started in queer community in around 2011, 2012, learning how to build online communities specifically for people who weren't out yet, who were still closeted, or who were stealth, uh, which kind of took me around the world. And I got a degree in anthropology of virtual worlds and communication. Um, and once I graduated from school back in 2016, 2017, I'm like, yeah, I can build communities. I have no idea how the internet works. So I went and I <laughs> learned how to be a full stack marketer. Um, so ever since then, I started working for a scientific uh, company called Keystone Symposia. You're going to hear a lot about them in this talk. And ever since uh, learning with the scientists, I kind of started Socially Constructed so that I could help online community managers and C-suite teams build the infrastructure they needed to help people talk to one another. So that's the boring thing about who I am. Uh, now we're going to talk about you. Uh, because with all of my webinars, I am asking for three major promises from you. Uh, each promise is interconnected with one another. I want you to take what's learned here because we're gonna have so much information just thrown your way. I want you to plan big, get creative, start iterating on a lot of the stuff, but do me a favor, just progress very small. Um, take one step, first get good, then get better. Use the mistakes from that first step because it's certainly not gonna go clean to revise your plan and make a better plan. Uh, it needs to be iterative. And that's one of the big things about these webinars, these talks and implementing on them. The easiest way to do that, pick one thing, go and implement it and then come back later. I have my own Discord community where I'll always be available for you to continue to talk about this. This presentation is always going to be available on CMX and on my YouTube channel. 
Uh, and the slides, I'm more than happy to provide them to you, provided Google Drive does not delete them. Um, so those are the big three promises that I have before starting this talk. And now I want to start with a story. This is uh, Keystone Symposia. Uh, this is an event from Keystone. This is absolutely beautiful, Silverthorne, Colorado. Uh, and this event was the first event coming back from COVID, uh, physical events. Uh, Keystone Symposia was a physical events company uh, that I joined back in 2019. And prior to my joining, they had never had a digital marketer before. They had never had an online community manager before, but their job was to run 65 physical events per year about a variety of molecular scientific topics. Uh, they were a really important part of the peer review process in primary science, where a lot of up and coming people in their fields and a lot of experts could come together to discuss content that has not yet gone through peer review. So this was brand new cutting edge research. None of the events were virtual. Uh, all of them were planned and processed more or less manually. The uh, CRM or the customer relationship management tool they had was uh, sourced from like 2004, a uh, very manual process. And all of these 65 events occurred during ski seasons around the world. So all 65 events occurred in October or April. Uh, the math works out to running three or four physical events of around 500 scientists traveling all over the world per week to do this. And everything went really swimmingly, all 65 events per year, until predictably, you're probably ahead of me on the story here, coronavirus happened. Uh, when COVID happened, again, keep in mind, we're a scientific organization. We are expected to be the leaders of the pack, studying and understanding how COVID worked. Uh, we had four or five meetings that had to be planned, complete emergencies, headlined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, um, leaders at the WHO. There was a tremendous amount of pressure for us to run events, and the science had to go on. So we had to create a virtual infrastructure for this scientific community. Now, keep in mind, again, they were all physical all the time. I was their first foray into the digital world. So this is the challenge that the company was given. We had to convert all 65 physical events within about a nine month period uh, to virtual. We didn't have infrastructure. We couldn't prove it. We couldn't do anything. We had to keep the same dates, keep the same times. And we only really had seven net skilled employees capable of running virtual webinars or building virtual infrastructure. Uh, so there were about four comms people, three IT professionals who were helping us on this. All of the rest of the company had to be trained from their physical jobs, uh, doing largely event-based management in a manual way to virtual work within a period of nine months. It's a huge challenge. And uh, we had to run all 65 of these events while we were planning the next set of events. Some of them, again, because we're keeping the same dates, we had four or five events running simultaneously on any given week. And we had them running from January of 2021 all the way through to the supposed end of the pandemic, uh, moving into mid-June. Uh, so we were busy. Uh, and this presented quite a few challenges, quite a few problems, because there was only one of me. There was one community manager, right? Um, so we're not going to list all of this off. I honestly could have just go on and on about what the main challenges were. But one of the big problems we had was a lack of trust in virtual environments, a lack of trust from scientists in online community management. Uh, we were running so many events. There was so much Zoom burnout already. And these were scientists who were on the front end of COVID trying to figure it out, work round the clock in order to fix it. They were tired. Um, so how were we going to build this infrastructure? How was I going to scale and rapidly improve the communication happening at these events in an online environment when they didn't actually trust it? 
we just needed community facilitators. And the only options that we really honestly had were the 42 other employees at Keystone Symposia who until now knew really nothing about online community management. They weren't scientists. Their jobs were to just create events for scientists. And we had to really upscale them real fast and get them to the point of being amazing, top-notch community facilitators that provided a best of breed product. So I had three things that I could tell them. Uh, I, they got exactly one week for them to get onboarded, one week to watch me facilitate, and then one week for me to watch them facilitate. And then they had to be off to the races. So the question is, what were the three things I told them? They had to be able to accomplish all of these tasks. The role of a community facilitator is to host the space, to create hype and set the energy, to encourage conversation, educate and guide members, um, navigate group interactions. I had to get all of this into three main things I told them. So I taught them three things, and we're going to go over them with you now in the hopes that uh, you'll be able to just kind of go off to the races, completely scale your community facilitation and your moderation efforts in your own communities. So first off, we set precedent and build momentum. Uh, this is going to be a really important topic that we go over. That's the foundation of the next two. Um, how do you understand and use the concept of power distance? Uh, we'll define that in a little bit. And then forging conversation through opinion, not through requests or questions. Um, so let's start with the first one, setting precedent and building momentum. Here's my hot take. In every webinar, I have a hot take. I have a thing about the industry, right? Here's mine. Uh, your job, it doesn't matter what role in community you have, your job is to set precedent for a thing a single tactic relating to a strategy, and then build momentum for that thing until the community is doing it on its own. And at that point, you can go off and you're freed up to do more things. And this is a growth cycle that occurs. So the question is, how does this actually work? So think about this like a cell. You have a specific boundary for your community. You have limits and you have a specific culture that you are building. Uh, community is a set unit of a culture. And then you have the stakeholders in your company. So this is your brand, the people at the very nucleus of your company. And your idea is to say, I want our community to do this thing. I think that it's going to be healthier for them if they do this thing. But they're not just going to go forward and do that. You have to convince them. You have to encourage them. You have to get people on your side. You have to build them. So there's this concept of saying, here in the nucleus, we're having this conversation. We're thinking about this thing. Uh, so there's this aspect of transparency. Uh, what's going on behind the scenes? How much of it can we see? And then there's this concept of porosity. How involved can those members be? Can they walk into your nucleus? Can they join your discussions? Can they join your groups? So the transparency lets you know what needs to happen. The porosity is the level of trust you have in those active promoters being able to have a sway on what you're doing. Once you have those active promoters crossing that boundary, they work just like RNA in a cell. They take your DNA, they take your precedent, and then they start to activate it. Active promoters talk to engaged members. And once they see you exemplifying the trait, the precedent that you're trying to set in your community, your engaged members will fall in line as well. And then when everyone else joins, they're not getting the information from your core nucleus. They're getting the information from engaged members, which engages them. So now you have this cell that is far more active and you didn't really necessarily have to follow the entire process. You simply set precedent and then you built momentum until it occurred throughout the community. So what does this look like in practice? Um, in a lot of cases, you can do it very, very simply. Over here on the far left is a discussion 
that we're having about building YouTube channels. And all I did was I just started by uh, creating a tag on my chat that just simply says question. I didn't use the Q&A channel. I didn't use infrastructure that removes questions from chat. Instead, I added the question to the chat and that allows the rest of the participants to be like, oh yeah, here's what my opinion might be. Here's what I'm doing. So by creating this natural language down here, Roger did the exact same. He saw value in the function. He started doing it. And Cecilia, who is the community manager for digital marketer at the time, um, she found this very, very helpful because now we have all of our uh, conversations and language tagged in one neat little stream. So she didn't have to bounce back and forth. We just had it going through and people could uh, communicate and respond on their own. All I did was tag it one question and almost immediately we saw that precedent become momentum. You can also see that it occurs in longer term forums as well. Uh, David has a connection for uh, connecting locally. And over time, by setting the precedent for this occurring and the steps and the rules, you can now see over on the right that uh, several of the people, um, so here Yasu uh, is actually tagging individuals and also self-policing the community. In a way, David and Beth have now multiplied themselves uh, by training the community and building momentum for them to no longer have to reinforce these rules. So super simple concept, super basic, but at the same time, understanding it as setting precedents and building momentum can solve a lot of problems. Um, you can also see that it happens in chat, just like we have uh, here. If we set a precedent in the chat and we bring the speaker into that conversation, we can really open up a lot more conversation and people are going to um, feel more confident commenting as opposed to just asking content related questions. So how is this useful? What can this do? Um, we see here a very traditional bulletin board style system um, for the open source uh, program Scribus. This is actually what I build my workbooks in. Really, really amazing program, but a lot of people use it for things that they shouldn't be using it for. And when they go to the forum, they're asking very, very basic questions. And you can see that the community manager for the forum is actually the programmer for the program. And you can see that he's getting tired. And one of the big issues he's running into is something called the burden of contribution. Uh, so the burden of contribution is somewhat unintuitive and it's about a work reward problem. So how can precedent and momentum work to resolve this issue? Uh, Here's the skin of the problem. Work naturally concentrates onto a set of active people, software maintainers, people who are doing the concepts. The reward of community spreads away from the people doing that work. So a whole bunch of people get 90 blogs before they create one lead to really help you build and curate content. Reward feels less worthwhile to those who are doing the work than those benefiting from it but we still do it, right? We still have this concept. So to kind of better illustrate it, let's talk about Amazon because it's a very hierarchical scale, right? So you have down at the bottom, a bunch of workers who are setting up packages, running those packages, putting them into distribution, and there's a ton of them, right? So you start to get this notion that maybe the work is spreading, but the reality is when you look at the hierarchy, the people at the bottom are achieving the lion's share of Amazon's work. And then the money, as it trickles up, that reward is starting to build. If you zoom out of that, now we have Amazon shopping days. We have uh, two-day delivery. It is applying more and more and more stress to a very small amount of Amazon's hierarchy, while the reward continues to spread in both areas. And what are Amazon workers thinking? I'm not getting paid enough or I'm not doing enough um to warrant this kind of work um so they start to feel like there's a burden of their contribution in amazon so let's take it out of that example and put it into something a little bit more viable for online communities you can see here open source project contributions uh starting with very very little amount of work going further and further 
there's a very popular statistic about 80% of uh, open source software contributions occurring uh, by like two to 10% of the population. I don't remember the exact metric, but you can see why. Um, the more time you start to spend on something, the less worthwhile it seems until you get to a point where you're a primary maintainer. And now that 13% is expected to do 80% of those contributions. We still do it though, because we love the work. So as a community manager, what can you learn from setting precedent and building momentum to solve this problem? The reality is work concentrates, reward spreads. If you focus on building precedents and structures in your community that reverse this process, you can let the chaos ensue, do anything you want as you build momentum, and then you will reap the rewards of that benefit while making your community healthier. So what precedents allow you to spread that work and what precedents allow you to concentrate that reward into a very salient, I understand why my contribution matters for each of your community members. So let's take a quick break here uh, to kind of look at um, comments and questions and things like that, um, kind of practice what we preach, you know, um, before we move into the next topic. Does anyone have any questions for Venya? I'm looking at the Q&A section and not seeing anything yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you can also just use chat and put questions so that other people can respond to the question as well, because a lot of other people may have a better answer than I do for your specific problem. Well, have a think and we'll continue. Um, you can also DM me too if you want. So take it away. All right. So we're going to move to the uh, next one. Um, so we're putting it into action and we're facilitating conversation to set the precedent for letting them do their job for you, right? So the benefits are very clear. Um, you don't, first, don't remove yourself from a conversation. Show what a contribution looks like. Set precedent. Um, comments will stoke engagement uh, more than questions might. But at the same time, they require building the confidence necessary for community members to provide comments. Um, so you should learn and track and tag expertise, learn who your community members are, and encourage them to participate, um, and a few other benefits. But the problem occurs when things start to get out of hand, right? Because you are the nucleus. You cannot control the chaos of your community, and that's how you receive the benefits of spreading the work and concentrating the reward. Um, unfortunately, that also means that a lot of people can step out of line, they can do things that may, maybe don't work. Um, so how do you manage that? And that's where we get into our second concept. Um, can I just get like a text thumbs up or a hands up or anything like that? Um, so I have a good understanding of how many people may have heard of this before. How many are aware of what power distance is? Okay, it's new to you, Lucy. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so it looks like I get to nerd out a little bit here uh, just to kind of give you some context, which I think is really, really great. Um, so communicative power distance is uh, originally a theory by uh, Jeff Hofstetter, um, or sorry, Hofsted. Uh, and the concept was, sociologically speaking, in any structure that includes a hierarchy, there is a certain amount of power afforded to each level in the hierarchy. So people who are senior managers have more power than people who have lower um, setups, which makes a lot of sense. Um, what he was interested in is how communication of these individuals um, changes, both all over the world, uh, based upon the kind of culture that we're in, whether or not we're collective or highly individual, um, and also based upon what that power dynamic looks like in an organization. So if you've ever heard things like, my boss, he's my boss, I can't say that. If you've heard things like, um, he's so aggressive sometimes in a conference room, and I just get intimidated by the mere fact of talking to him. When you hear things like, uh, 
do you kiss your mother with that mouth? This is like instilling a sense of power distance between a younger individual and an older individual. So as a more salient example, let's say there's a problem uh, in your organization and your CEO up at the very, very top says, we're gonna create an anonymous suggestion box. And then I'm gonna read it at the meetings and I'm going to approach that problem. The notion of this is saying, um, because it's anonymous, I am saying anyone in the organization is free to talk about anything they wanna talk about. But what this ignores is the fact that between the CEO and the people who are submitting to the suggestion box are managers and there's workforce politics between departments. And then there's the manager's managers and there's the C-suite that's involved. So there are a lot of people who might once they hear the anonymous comment in their workplace, feel threatened and therefore not submit their totally valid question to the comments box. Instead, what they'll do is they'll use something called grapevine communication. So grapevine communication is this concept that people will use communication channels explicitly outside of the structure of a company in order to get their mind across. So they'll go to the bar to complain about their boss and the complaints about the boss will uh, find their way to a completely different department. And then that individual will feel more comfortable talking to the boss because they're more even keeled, they're more level. So if you've ever felt like it's really difficult to talk to your boss, but it's really easy to talk to one of their uh, equal colleagues, this might be a concept of why. So power distance is really important. You can also see this is a complete aside. Over on the right-hand side, power distance does change depending upon the culture you come from. Here in the United States, we're very headstrong. We really, really like um, just saying, hey, look, there's a problem. We need to talk about it. We're very task-oriented. Whereas in Japan, for instance, it's very collective. Uh, if there is a person up at the top, you just fall in line with them. So there's actually this concept I think is hilarious of uh, the egregious American, uh, where in Japan, if they have an internship with an American, they feel a lot better because the American's going to be more the loud mouth, more willing to challenge, uh, which is kind of nicer and sets the tone for them, uh, which is kind of interesting. So that's what communicative power distance is. So now we're going to move from this ethereal concept, this uh, item of power distance into what does this actually look like? Um, when I was in college doing my uh, thesis on uh, Guild Wars 2 and role-playing games, we had a leader named Sarah who was responsible for managing this role-playing guild. And we had a way of managing conversation based upon power distance. She would reduce the power distance by going into character and talking with us, but she would increase the power distance by using specific channels. So you can see here that Sarah in um, all of the other colors is more than happy to be jovial, uh, like this is supposed to be fun for them. But then she goes into character and she's like, ranks, not rows. Did any of you read the handbook? And she's acting like a soldier. She's acting like a commander, like a leader. And in doing so, she's reinforcing this concept of go read the handbook and fall in line, do what you need to do. But then everyone else is having so much fun out of character. You can see the blue, um, I've got my work cut out for me. Um, sorry, you sacks of muck. Uh, this conversation um, starts to have a closer power distance um, in game and then out of game, it has an increased power distance. So she's able to manipulate this concept. So how do you put this into action? Um, understanding power distance between key stakeholders, understanding power distance in what you're afforded as a community manager and understanding the power distance of uh, your C-suite in your company can go a long way to um, helping people fall in line, moving a power distance up whenever you have an announcement to make to market things. So it sounds less like it's coming from a community professional and more like it's coming from a marketer. 
they separate those channels of communication, which is really, really helpful for you in setting precedent and building momentum. You can also increase that distance between um, facilitators and members. Uh, like I said, you could just put question in your uh, statement. You can also have a specific emoji. We actually use the preach emoji for Keystone Symposia. Whenever we saw the preach sign, it was a announcement to the community, which separated it from the more close power distance discussions that encouraged conversation. Um, additionally, you can monitor power dynamics. Uh, in monitoring those power dynamics, you can understand why some of your close-knit key stakeholders, your active groups, uh, might be struggling to get engagement from the newer members who might be a tad bit intimidated. Uh, whenever you see that silence happening, consider whether or not there's a power dynamic involved between your more active or veteran members and the members that they were talking to and see if you can lower the power distance between those two groups. So that's how that works. Um, before we move on to this, let's have a quick break to uh, kind of discuss what power distance might look like. If you have a case study or if you're like, light bulb happened, this is a thing I would absolutely love to hear from you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think avatar, avatars can relieve power distance? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the fun thing about avatars um, is there's actually, one thing that you could do is you can select an avatar and then give it like various facial expressions and just save them as different images, right? And you can actually build power distance into, oh, this was a joke, smirking avatar. Uh, you can use emojis to do it too. And if you build this avatar on an online bulletin board style system, it's a really, really great way of personifying who you are and then making it very clear where you stand when you interact. Um, a really great example of that is a user on budget light forums. They're a uh, community that build open source flashlight hardware and software. They're, they're incredible. But there's this one particular user named Toy Keeper who actually has different avatars for her moods. And she changes the avatar based upon all of her conversations. Um, and she's just become quite famous on the board for doing that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does anyone Are there any other big questions? And stories or examples of power distance would also be cool too. I think it would be interesting to find a study about power <laughs> distance in um, supposedly flat organizations or decentralized ones. Oh, um, yeah. If there is one, um, that would be really interesting because I don't know if it is ever fully achievable, um, but I do wonder like what the reduction is and how it manifests. Yeah, and there's actually been a lot of power distance studies specifically in open source software on GitHub and how some contributions and polls uh, might be based more upon cultural implementation as opposed to did you do the work or did you submit? Actually, I had a specific question to you to ask you about power distance in GitHub and how to manipulate power distance in GitHub to support open source community. Yeah, sure. That was it. That was my specific question. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing that you might want to consider is something called the spiral of silence. Uh, so this is a theory related to power distance in that when a member contributes in some way, shape, or form, they are attaching their identity to their contribution on GitHub. And in some ways, it's it's very simple, right? It's just, here's who I am. I am submitting this fix or whatever. And then it's left to the community what they're going to do with it. Um, oftentimes, what will happen is you will get someone who contributes. And then when nothing comes of it, or when senior members start to say, hey, I think we need these tweaks, or I need these setups, 
it's it's more task oriented and there's no like relational benefit to it that can sometimes scare them off because then they're just like okay so the next time i may not be able to submit and then there's this spiral down toward being less and less active more and more silent so you can actually see a much higher drop off rate of what would otherwise be really awesome contributors uh, not receiving the cultural benefits that they need to contribute on GitHub. Um, so spiral of silence might be something to consider. Um, so and spiral of silence is something I'm currently struggling with. And my first, my first solution was that I don't care how busy we are. If somebody did work for us for free, we have to acknowledge it before we do anything yeah. else. And in addition to acknowledging, we now are increasing velocity for interacting with code and I'm trying to create a culture where we mentor. It's not just that like, we can't use this because of this reason. It's like, hey, uh, can I help you with the design of this? Because you know I'm an insider in traffic. So I know some design aspects of the product that you might not have in your back pocket. Um, and while that's a cultural change within our own our own environment that's been very difficult to manage. I'm I'm worried that uh, because of the slowness of that cultural change, um, we we need to, to do something else so that people can see the change more rapidly and consistently, so that yeah. we don't continually lose them. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. Uh, what have you? Um worked to implement for that um so far what have you tried so so far i'm non-technical so um the first thing i did was created um worked with my team so that the engineers would map their most common responses um and and created friendly uh templates that can easily be put into their own words their own tone of voice so that okay. they're not you know, copying and pasting something that doesn't sound like them and isn't authentic to them. Yeah. Um, the next thing we did was, it took several months, but we implemented an internal tracking system so that we would know like where people were within the system, within, within the process. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, and actually this actually was implemented even faster than the other two. I, my team hates to say no. They don't want to say anything. And so I was like, being saying nothing is the most unkind thing you can do. It's way better to say, nope, this doesn't work for us for X, Y, Z reason and fork it than it is to say nothing. And so I've yeah. stepped in and I'm telling people no left and right, or I'm asking for more detail or, you know, explaining that we have a code of conduct and you don't get to be racist here. Um, and it's fine. I don't mind drawing that flack because I believe that, that, by the nature of doing that, I am building my cred with the whole community as somebody who is responsive to their needs, even when you their are. need is uncomfortable for me. Yeah, exactly. And I think you're doing perfectly there. Um, like the uh, mantra that I have going in my head is always don't ever withdraw, yeah. engage. Um, because if you're looking for engagement from them, you need to be setting a precedent that that engagement is valuable. Mm -hmm. But um, I met one thing that I might recommend uh, mm -hmm. is mentorship opportunities. Uh, one of the big mistakes with mentor programs I think a lot of people make is that they are connecting one person to another person based upon their own idea of like, oh, this person would be a good plan for you. Um, what I recommend instead is actually throwing them into a micro community, into a small group where several mentors and several uh, new people can kind of connect and let them build their own relationships um, before saying, oh yeah, this mentor would be good for you. Uh, and a majority of the reason for that is because of that spiral of silence. Um, if things don't go well with an individual mentor, um, that's happening behind closed doors. People don't really see it. And if things go well, that's not showing either. So yeah. because a lot of people are immediately jumping to an interpersonal connection instead of a small group, um you're not seeing what's happening in that relationship so because it's github we're doing it all 
publicly. And what I'm doing instead is dropping them into a group of engineers and the engineers with the concept that like the understand the concept, they always get no, no fewer than two um, to have that conversation. And then occasionally I'm like, mm, your communication style is not working here. Let's try this instead. Um but I'm I'm kind of concerned because we have a, a fairly aggressive goal for ramping up and letting people know that they're that they what they are doing is welcome. We were we weren't ignoring them because we wanted to. We were ignoring them because the team got so excited about building things for them that they forgot that their job is to build with them. <laughs> yeah, um, that definitely happens a lot. Uh, but I think setting the precedent among your uh, engineers and your key stakeholders that they are just as much facilitating communication as you are um, definitely helps build that momentum if you just count those engineers as your engaged members. I think we've got another question. Um, I'm hope that I'm please please correct me if I mispronounce your name, Fida. Um, would you like to ask your question to Venya? Hello, thank you. Um, yes, uh, your spelling is uh, correct. Um, I'm Faida from Indonesia, uh, oh. Southeast Asia. Uh, do you know Bali? <laughs> yeah, Bali is in Indonesia. I'm in Jakarta now. And... Uh, here now is uh, 2 a.m. actually, so this is uh, at the mid of the night. Um, before I tell my uh, question, uh, I'm sorry uh, if my speaking is uh, not fluent in English because my native, uh, uh, native language is Bahasa. So uh, now I am a um, community specialist in public sector in Ministry of Education. And we are, uh, we are managing um, some teachers uh, in uh, Indonesia and most of them in rural area. So uh, we, we can uh, we usually uh, make a um, virtual event like webinar and uh, some classes uh, and the other upgrading event and we make it uh, in online uh, in online uh, mode so uh, how we we can uh, engage them uh, more how, how we can uh, make a more engagement uh, with them uh, while uh, all the event is virtual. So how we can optimize uh, the power distance uh, to this uh, situation? Yeah. I think that's my question. OK. Um, I want to rephrase it because I want to make sure I understand the question. First off, you're an absolute trooper for being here at 2 AM. Um, that's just incredible. And I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, second, I believe the question was, you have a community of educators in your local geographic area uh, working in the public sector. And because you have to move into an online forum, you're struggling to get them to engage. And you're wondering if it might be related to power distance problems. Is that right? Yes, correct. OK. Um, so one of the things. Uh, I can kind of empathize with you on this. Uh, getting primary scientists at Keystone Symposia to talk to one another uh, was super, super difficult because a lot of them um, tend to fall into a specific set where they're like, I follow this person's uh, research. So I really, really want to just talk to this person and the people they recommend. Um, so there's this aspect of power distance of I know this person. I look up to this person. I want to talk to this person. And then on the other hand, they're just like, well, this person seems intimidating. They're like the lead of the World Health Organization, or it's Anthony Fauci. I don't know if I can talk to them. So building precedent infrastructure to have two people with broadly different power distance levels, like a CEO talking to a lower level, um, you need to build infrastructure that allows them to have that discussion in grapevines. So you may not actually want to create a formal infrastructure for that. 
just throw them into a community that doesn't have that infrastructure and convince them to talk by asking the leader to um, engage and set the precedent that they are willing to talk. Um, a great example is AMAs. So saying, hey, we have this expert in this community. We are going to go to that expert's community to have an AMA with them instead of having it here in this community. And that makes them a lot more approachable. It makes them more direct. It moves them to their community for them to talk. And that grapevine communication, hopefully, should also bleed into your own community by virtue of them being present. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. OK, so we start from uh, the leaders, right? Yeah. So reduce the power distance of the people okay. who are the upper echelons, the people that most of your community respects. Try and reduce mm -hmm. their perceived power distance by getting them closer. Um, the idea is consider them celebrities and then bring them down from celebrity status. OK, makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Does that help? I feel like I rambled a bit there. <laughs> it's excellent. It's really excellent. Especially All the right. AMA's point. Mm -hmm. Especially the AMA's point. Yeah. Um, I. It took me a long time to really discover that one because I kept being like, no, it needs to be within the community boundary. But you should honestly substantiate grapevine communication as much as you do formal structured communication. Yes, it's, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer other questions after we move into our third one. So the third one is actually going to be pretty quick uh, because it's using the other two theories more or less to stoke better conversation. Um, and when it comes to stoking conversation, uh, like we have been discussing, there's a lot of great fine communication, but there's also imparting value. And one of the big issues that a lot of people have on Twitter, for instance, is they will publish a question and get absolute crickets, and they have no idea what's going on. So they publish another one, and they're like, well, if the question is enough for our followers to like get involved, then it'll work, right? Not necessarily. But then you go over to LinkedIn, and they're just like, all right, hot take. Here's my opinion. Here's why. Here's structure. That's getting a crazy amount of conversation. So understanding what actually allows people to communicate more naturally is a really important aspect. So um, the theory, the setup that I invite you to use here is social, pres uh, social penetration theory. Uh, this is actually by Erwin Altman, not Shrek. But the concept is uh, people are like onions. We have layers. Sometimes we don't like specific layers being ripped off. Sometimes it takes a little bit for us to get to know each other, to understand each other. And it's really important to recognize that specific community precedents will yield specific um, conversations, but you have to make sure that your actions, your precedents, match where your community is right now. So here's the idea. There are two different actions that you can perform when getting to know a person. There's uh, asking questions about breadth. Breadth is the quantity of information disclosed to another individual. Um, so this is basically like, what'd you do today? What are your hobbies? Where are you going with this? Uh, and it's basically just bouncing around the outer shell. And then there's depth. Depth is the frequency of one specific category. So um, once you get into a specific conversation, you dig a, a little bit deeper and then a little bit deeper, and now you know something more inherent about that person. So the idea here is to recognize that there are specific intents or goals to the way that you will interact with your community that need to match where they feel like they are. Um, if, if it's highly superficial, don't ask a highly in-depth question or you're going to get crickets. If it's something that you want to increase disclosure, then you can uh, comment and say, here's something deeper about me. I have now opened up this onion. This is a comment about my opinions. And I want to start this discussion. And then once they get a little bit deeper, now you can start asking the questions and they'll start to interact. 
Um, so understanding where specific users are here is a good idea. And for those of you familiar with orbits or with shells or um, the cellular idea, uh, this is kind of the basis. This is where a lot of that comes from. Understanding how you're talking to each person will really, really help for stoking a better conversation by understanding where on the onion your questions really are. So let's do an example here. Um, we're not actually going to do this because we're unfortunately out of time, but I would be more than happy to do this on my Discord afterward. Um, I think that it's a really, really great activity and opportunity. Um, I would like you to do this with your team members or with your community members. Just say, I walked my dog. And you're going to have one person uh, in the first part whose job it is to express this day that they had walking their dog and elaborate on it in very small chunks, four to 12 words. And the idea is to have all of the other people grasping and struggling to find the right questions to get a breadth of the picture and then a depth of the narrative. So what questions are causing you to dance around that onion? What questions are causing you to move into different layers? And this is a really good way to stretch that muscle that intuitive connection to stoke better conversation. But then I want you to turn around and do it again. But this time, you're not asking questions of the individual. You are telling your own story, your own narrative about walking your own dog. And then you're going to look at how that conversation completely changed. And what are the differences in that conversation? Uh, did conversations become richer? one way or the other? Did they become more natural? Were there more pauses as people kept trying to think of questions or think of what was happening in their narrative or their own comments? Are they easier? Um, what is the nature of the relationship in the conversation? And what changed between those comments and those questions? So I invite you to do this. Either uh, we can do it after this, or we can do it in my Discord, or you can do it among your team. I strongly recommend just doing an I walked my dog exercise. And what you will find is that with social penetration theory, um, a lot of the questions that you might have as a key stakeholder, because you're coming in and saying, this is the goal, this is the precedent I want to set, you'll find that it's not actually quite in line. And uh, you'll find better, stronger questions to ask once you frame all your actions within social penetration theory. So that'll be it for that section. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the actual uh, presentation done as a whole. Uh, how can I stop presenting here? There we go. And uh, I hope that it was helpful. We have uh, some more time available for us to meet. And I'm going to go ahead and post a Discord link in the chat um for you to join me there if you want to and otherwise we can kind of move on from the presentation and into fun conversation steps thank you who would like to get the ball rolling does anyone what a try um, venues experiment here with um, the walking the dog. Yeah, I mean, Tiffany, you're not wrong. <laughs> know if I can be heard. Yes, we hear you. Oh, you do. One yes, thing that was really you. interesting. Hi. Yeah, I was doing this meetup and I was ill prepared. So our community is more about um, kind of online monthly tech meetups, right? And I was ill prepared for this meetup, which actually ended up creating a lot of um, engagement in a terrific way that people all really liked. I needed to present something because we had a speaker drop out 
And so I thought, well, I'm just going to go through showing, doing a demonstration of some features of the software. And I'm not going to have all the answers. And what ended up happening is all of these people, I think that's what you're talking about, social penetration and the vulnerability or, you know, um, kind of being authentic, is that what ended up happening is we had all these other people in the meetup engage and participate because they're like, well, here's what I know about it. And, you know, so being someone who didn't have all the answers, but still was expert enough to initiate the whole shebang, um, created so much more engagement and warm feeling and authentic connections between everyone because I could be honest about not knowing what I didn't know. And it just, yeah, just engaged more interaction. I don't know if that applies to what you were talking about, but it, it kind of humbled me to be like, maybe it's better if I'm not always the expert. I use I vulnerability think. all the time. Um, I, I find that it's a really valuable communication technique, especially like say in interviews where I'm just going to be like, this is how I work. And if it's not going to work, I'd rather have a good fit than a bad experience. Um, but somewhat sexistly working in tech, I find that using the ideas of me being a non-technical woman in tech, um, putting me at a disadvantage to allow people to teach me, allows them to teach other people really well while I'm in the room. And because I am a super confrontational, not cool with sexism, that is uh, not helping me do the thing I want to have achieved in that moment. Um, when it veers into something that that can damage somebody else in the room, I slap it down really fast and hard. And I found that that combination of being allow, allowing, allowing my vulnerability to show enough that it's okay that it occasionally uh, confirms like sexist ideas has really made more space for the women around me, especially, and the queer folks around me to to grow out of that role and not only be taught but teach um, because I get to be the target for that. And I find that that has been a really interesting tool similar to how you used your uncertain knowledge of the product you were presenting on um, to allow people to have the space to, to teach rather than uh, mansplain, if that makes sense. I do think for the most part, you know, about that quote Mr. Rogers said about look for the helpers. I do think there are more helpers than not in the world. And I think it's it's really good that um, I think it was, was it you, um, Angela, who, who was speaking about being vulnerable and, you know, just kind of putting it out there. Um, yeah, and I don't know if it's so much vulnerability as just being real, like even us experts are learning new all the time. And I think it helps the people who don't feel like they're experts to feel like, oh, I'm okay if I don't know it all. And especially the women in the room. I think that's important too in the tech sector is like, oh, people might look up to me as someone who knows a lot. But if I say, wow, when I encounter some new feature, it takes me time to figure it out too. Let's all figure this out together, you know? And we do end up having, I think we had equal amounts of a man and a woman and a couple, a woman and a man, you know, different genders kind of piping in and same things. And I think people tend to repeatedly come to our meetups because I, I do kind of allow for that, like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. <laughs> You know, but yet I don't give up my authority. That's one thing I feel like is really important. I never give up my authority. I just am honest. Absolutely. I think that's really impressive. And I think that's a really good approach to 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 meetups and, and events, because especially um, for folks who are very introverted, um, who feel really uncomfortable in social settings, that would be, you know, 
folks like me who feel very uncomfortable and, you know, are learning how to get over that. But the fact that, you know, you created, you've kind of eliminated that um, perceived power distance and by being the leader and, and by being vulnerable, um, I think that really is, is really a big credit to you. Um, you've really created a strong, you know, a strong um, situation like that. So I think that's really impressive. I, I am grateful that. that the men in our group are, are the men in our group are helpers. And so I don't ever get a sense of being mansplained or talked down to. And sometimes they're wrong and I'll be like, yeah, that's not quite how that works. But <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> thank you for saying something, you know, <laughs> like. Yeah, um, I, well, I think but, too, I think, I've been seeing a lot more in my demi mound, like less of that and more like I want to be helpful kind of stuff. So it hasn't been, you know, very split gender wise um, and other folks might have a different experience. Um, I think especially if you work in a company where everybody's like really busy and just, you know, any help anybody can give each other is a good thing can certainly um, where, you know, kind of, push that barrier away too. Um, My communities have huge gender just like splits. Really? Um, oh, massive. And part of it is in who's considered, uh, a large part of it is in who's considered an expert. Um, and so what I have found is that, um, I, I agree with Angela very strongly that I don't I don't give up my, my position of power within the community. I am the when I am running an event, I am the leader of the event. Whether I need to be the center of that event or not is totally different. Um, but uh, by having me as a leader, a woman, um, I find that women are much more likely to speak even when we have a man who's very concerned about making sure that women are having spaces to speak. I also find that um, by turning the conversation from a conversation of um, lecturing to show experience to like someone teaching, which is just a different mode, that uh, women teachers are more likely to stand up because women speakers, it's very hard to get, but a woman who wants to teach what's cool with them is, uh, is really much easier, although still difficult. And I often, I have this thing I say when I'm specifically talking to um, folks who aren't just like straight white men that is, and I'm trying to get them to speak for me at an event. Um, I'm always told, well, I don't have the experience. And I'm like, well, you've been doing this for 20 years. And if I went into that room over there and asked every man who's been there for six months, they would say, you know, I'm not sure, but I can come up with an idea by the end of the hour. Like, so it's, it's not that the people who are speaking are the experts. It's that they're the ones who, are, who don't feel that they are under as much threat if they speak and it doesn't go well. Um, and I'm going to just make sure that you have as few threats as possible. I'm going to be there with you to, to make sure that you have the practice, the experience, that we've practiced any questions you want. And we're not going to overprepare you. We're not going to do it to the point where you're anxious, but we're going to do it to the point where you're you feel supported and satisfied with what you're about to do. Um, and that has been something that, that really affects how I think of my uh, community facilitators is that they really have to be people who see that difference and don't necessarily talk down to the newbie who thinks they can give a talk um, if they just had an hour to prepare, but does make sure that the people who who always feel like expertise is out of reach despite the fact that they are clearly demonstrated experts um have the space to reimagine themselves in that role i think this is really really interesting and i feel like we have another talk here because we've touched on a couple different communities that aren't necessarily the majority and um how you know, how folks identify and how they are in the world and um, how, you know, the perceived power distance, like, especially like communities of color, women, the LGBTQIA community, um, you know, I think we could have a whole other really um, 
really interesting and um, thoughtful discussion about too, about how we do that in our communities, um, how we can make it a safe environment and um, the different <clears throat> things we can do. So um, thank you both for bringing up those comments because your, your observations and your experiences because um, it's certainly getting me thinking and um, I feel like I wanna continue investigating. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I think this has been really wonderful. Okay, um, I think I posted um, Venya's Discord, but I'm gonna do it one more time um, in case you wanna continue the conversation with her and anybody else who's joining. And it's right here. And if you go into her Discord, you'll see that there's different areas within it. And one of them is general chat. And Venya, is that an okay place for folks to continue over to? Um, yeah, and I would encourage you to visit her Discord anyways, because we have a book club. Um, everybody's always talking about interesting things, and it's just a really nice, interesting, thoughtful group. So um, unless anybody has any other questions, um, I think we'll wrap up for today. And I sure do appreciate everybody coming. Thank you, Angela, Alex, Fida, Hillary, Tiffany. Um, and who have I missed? Venya, of course. Um, if I missed anybody, um, forgive me, Lou was here for a little bit. Um, so thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you again. And um, if any folks are in the Metro Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins area, we're gonna have a couple of in-person meetups. And I did post a little bit of that earlier in the general area and it's on the CMX Slack channel too. Um, so if you'd like to join us for a happy hour and dinner at the Yak and the Yeti in August or mini golf and ice cream and waffles and um, uh, a retrospective on the, the summit in September with Venya and myself and whoever else wants to join, we're going to be doing that too. So thank you so much again, Venya. Thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you at the next one. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and, uh, this was definitely very fun. Um, I hope to further the conversation, um, especially when it does come to DEI and how it relates to Spiral of Silence. I think that was an incredible conversation. Uh, I agree, let's continue it. Vinia, be before you go, you said that you'd be willing to share your, your deck. Would it, when you do that, would it also be okay if I just got this excellent opportunity to educate one of my engineers on how not to shut down conversation? And I thought maybe I could use a couple of your slides if you don't mind. No, yeah, totally. Um, let me, uh, I believe I shared it already, but let me grab that oh, link beautiful. again. Is uh, it in the chat? And I'm just, uh, no, that's the Discord. Yeah, but chats happen. Um, funny thing, uh, for Keystone Symposia, we would actually do something called resource and then link it so that uh, there was always resource question, resource question, uh, connection that kind of thing. So we would just tag it so that we had everything in a single stream. Nice. That's really nice. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, if uh, we'll find it and we'll get it to you, Tiffany, for sure. Uh, she she just did and I oh, am perfect. incredibly grateful. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you guys so much again. Um and see you at the next one and thank thank great great session all. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.